Welcome to Startup Climb, where we bring you interviews with startup founders. Through this podcast, we hope to go behind the curtains to find out where it all begins. This is an inside look on their journey, their struggles, and how they overcome adversity. On this episode, we have Nicholas, the CEO and co-founder of Outside. Outside is a Singapore-based startup founded in 2015 with a community tasking app. Welcome, Nicholas. Hi, Nicholas. Uh, hi, Ryan. All right. So for those that uh, do not really know much about um, the app Outside, which you co-founded, why do you choose to start it and what is it about? All right. So I guess um, when we started, we were actually like 16 year olds. Like we were a bunch of friends that uh, tried a few ideas together. So we came across Outside in around 2015, the first time we conceptualized the idea. Right. Um, saw that there were multiple versions overseas that were like booming, like um, Air Tasker in Australia or right. Task Rabbit in the United States. Uh, ultimately, they either pivoted or focused on different areas. But um, it really made us feel that uh, there was a problem that, that we could solve, which is to connect everyday problems to everyday people so that everyone right. can actually help each other with daily inconveniences. So that's also the main reason that we kept going and we picked up skills along the way, which ultimately right. brought us to where we are today. If let's say um, you could describe outside at the app um, in like mm. two sentences, how would you describe it? Um, our, our usual blurb is that um, outside is a community tasking app that makes it right. fun and easy for people to help each other with daily inconveniences. Right, so, so you, you gamify the, the entire experience. Yes, uh, we are not fully done with the gamification yet, um, right. but we were described on media as the Pokemon Go for errands. So that might give a clearer picture of how it's like. It's a map with pins of things that you can do. Yeah, so currently it's only getting factor to the level. The next level is actually including a uh, EXP and leveling system to show the reliability of each user. Yeah. So um, users can get money out of it or how does that work? Yeah, so um, each task is actually um, transacted in, uh, of, of course, in real money, fiscal cash, right? right. So, um, sorry, fiat. Uh, yeah, so it is quite, it's, it's quite simple. Like you just pay through your card and you can withdraw through your bank. Yeah. Right. Right. So how big is your team currently? Um, if we include TAMs and interns, we are at 15 right now. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll dive a bit into that. Like, um, How long into the process of starting your startup do you make your first hire? And what was the function that you hire for? Mm, our company is a little weird because uh, we've been working together for like eight years. So... It's, it's kind of like the same team. So the co-founding team has been pretty similar throughout. Right. The first hire that we did was probably a marketing intern early last year. Right. Yeah. So that, that was when we were barely, when we launched the first version of the app, like uh, MVP of it. And we realized that uh, we really need someone to start trying to spread you know, more awareness about the company. So right. we couldn't afford someone that's like super highly paid, right? We, we had the idea of it and stuff. So we reached out and we hired a marketing intern to start handling our social media channels. Yeah. Right. So like marketing was the first function that you hired for. Hmm. But what are the qualities that you look for in your first hire? Because I think a lot of founders, um, they have two questions in their mind. And that's how I, I, I would see it, like in my opinion Ooh. is that the first question will be, when do I hire? Like when do I feel like I need to hire an additional person to help me? And the hmm. second question is, how do I find my first hire? Because normally your first hire is the uh, person that will be quite instrumental in growing your startup. So what were the qualities that you look for when you first hired a person? Uh, usually for us, um, I, I believe like if you if you look at it, it's pretty much um, how the founder views their uh, team, right? Whether it's a nature-based or nurture-based company. Right. Nature-based means that you usually hire people with um, high potential or people who already shown uh, credibility in their work. Whereas right. nurture is more of a point of view towards uh, this person's like uh, attributes towards their personality. And rather than their ability. Yeah, that's how I define it. So for us, we are more of a nurture-based company. So we usually pick people who we think that um, can grow with us rather than um, in other contexts, companies that have like higher you know, budgets and probably raised funds before and are not bootstrapping. They'd rather hire someone that's like 4 5K and is like a professional digital marketer. Right. right. Um, for us, we were still in the stage of exploring what messages work and we wanted to learn as a team. So my main focus was more towards um, this term that I always use, which is um, being autodidactic. Um, in general, it just means that this person is self-directed and able to pick up skills as that person goes. 
in that they're right. curious and constantly Google. And uh, that's the kind of um, personality that we look for. Mm. Right. So you want somebody who is very self-directed, very self-driven and um, able to look for ways to solve problems versus just waiting for directions and like uh, just being the hands of it, so-called. So yeah. that would be an important quality they look for. Yeah, especially in the startup scene, I suppose like um, things changes a lot and um, we were like constantly fighting fire after fire. So it's better to hire people who are able to, you know, adapt accordingly and make decisions by themselves and pick up skills that they need to get things done. And I, I'll probably say that most of our members has been like that so far. But would the flip side of the the coin be that um, because uh, the person is very self-driven, self-directed, uh, that also means that they have certain ideas of like what they want to do and stuff. And, and that might not normally be the same ideas that you have as a founder, right? Hmm. So how do you handle uh, conflicts or like maybe directional conflicts or like uh, in, in your company, right? Because like you all have a small team and each person is uh, self-driven, right? So like when it comes to like differing directions, how do you all handle this conflict? I think differing directions is not wrong. Like everyone has their own point of view of how things should work. But it's also our job as the founder to make sure that everyone's going to the same one direction, regardless of where that one direction is. So how we handled it uh, for us when we first started, of course, as friends, the biggest issue is um, drawing the line on professionalism first, right? And knowing who, what's the deliverables and what's expected of each other. And of course, um, when the interns come in, I think it's quite common that people don't dare to voice out at first. Like, it's okay, the logo should be smaller, the color's too bright, that kind of stuff. And... I'll say that what we do is that we, we do have uh, weekly stand-ups and we do have people who are attached to each member. So they can actually speak directly. They, they, they'll be under one of our co-founders throughout their whole time here. And usually we speak to them quite candidly. And I think we are all pretty much on the same level. Like they bully me every day. That's the level of the hierarchy in the company. Right. Yeah, so um, I don't think we had any issues in terms of like directions clashing. Because uh, we do have our ultimate goal. For us, it's always about connecting people to get things done, right? So right. we have the main KPIs that we set up every quarter. So we have like a company-wide meeting about how we should do things. And that's when people actually voice out about the direction that they think we should go. Like, hey, social media is not getting enough attention. We should pump more budget in and start creating more collaterals, for example. Yeah, and we will talk about, oh, is this the correct focus? Because, for example, we are launching a new feature this month and we want to wait till it's done before we start telling people about it. Right. Like this, this kind of alignment stuff is really down to priorities. I believe there's, there's still a direction of the company overall that we need to decide as the founder. And there should not be too much noises in the back if you actually address why things shouldn't be that way. Like ultimately, there's a restraint on manpower and stuff, right? So I think it's quite logical also. Mm. So if I could summarize that, um, that would be like what you're trying to say is that having regular communication, maybe an open channel, uh, mm. and a lack of a hierarchy system actually help you guys um, mesh out all the conflicts that you might have and, and come up with a clearer direction that everyone sort of agrees with. Mm, yeah, as, uh, yeah, I'll say that actually uh, the direction should be clear from day one from, from right. every company, right? So when they come in, they know where uh, during the interview process, they should know about the company and where you're heading to already. If right. they disagree, they probably wouldn't have joined. Right or if they yeah, right. like I feel that there shouldn't be that big of a difference in terms of our views in the first place. Okay. So yeah. Hmm. Okay, got it. So um, I think earlier you were talking about uh bootstrapping and how uh as a startup that is something that everyone goes through. So I'd like to go go towards the resource allocation side because mm. as a startup with uh, I would assume like a limited number of resources how do you prioritize like where to put your money at because like that I assume that the money would be like quite like it's not a lot because you, have, you don't have VC money right so like mm. what do you do like how do you prioritize like hey I need uh, more money into software development or I need more money in marketing so how will you allocate the resources okay so uh, we take manpower aside first right and just look at uh expenses in terms of infrastructure costs I, I don't believe that anyone would spend like thousands or even hundreds if it's properly done uh, uh, for right. a tech infrastructure so that's that's already benched in terms of like expenditure like for any startup for us we are consumer facing 
right? right. Um, all of our users are pretty much facing every single app that's trying to sell them stuff that is like Grab, GoJack and stuff like that, right? right? So our biggest channel, which is clear to us, is that if nobody posts a task on outside, no money flows through, right? So our focus is always about um, advertising and getting more users on board. So most okay. of our expenses are actually allocated towards marketing and uh, trying out different channels. Right. Yeah. In terms of uh, manpower, like uh, like I said, um, probably a bit unique for our end is that our whole team can do up the product ourselves. So we never had to hire uh, people or pay for additional stuff out of um, out of our own company to actually get technical stuff done. Right. Yeah. Mm. And there's a lot of free credits around for technical stuff. We're currently with Tencent Cloud, and before that, we were with Google Cloud. So right. you can constantly get like credits for your infra. So it shouldn't even cost you a cent there. <clears throat> right. Okay, that's very interesting. So that means because uh, you feel that your startup is more B2C, uh, consumer-facing, mm. thus um, marketing and advertising takes up a significant amount of budget. Right. Yes. Mm. Right. Okay, so... um. I would like to go a bit um to another direction, which is like VC funding, right? Would that be something that you would consider in the future, like taking venture capital money in order to grow and expand? I think um whenever you start up, there's two things that you want to keep in mind, right? Like two things you want to compare between um, bootstrapping and getting funded. So most of the young entrepreneurs that I spoke to, or uh, people who wanted to start up, they they have this dream of you know like getting funded before they are how old and stuff, which I feel that it's not wrong, but it's really dependent on what your business is and whether it's the right timing and the right scale. So for us, of course, naturally, if there's a time that comes that's suitable for us to raise funds and a good area of where the funds will be allocated, I'll be more than happy to take it at a reasonable equity. Right. Um, so I think every startup will tell you the same thing. And of course, like acquisition, if there's a partner that can make outside grow even bigger than what the rest of us can. Like let's say um just 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 by a moonshot um if Facebook decides to buy us over and we know that they have that social outreach and we know that now our ads are fully covered by them then right. it's a sure win for our ad right so yeah it's really dependent on how you view it but I believe everyone probably have the same view on that in terms of bootstrapping it's more of no choice lah to be honest if you think about it when you start out who who's gonna trust you with like a million dollar right away. Right. Right. You're going to prove that you can make money. You can prove that um, the product works. You guys can create the stuff and ultimately make some money first. And then you can show significant traction before you raise the money to grow even more money. That's right. pretty well, much how What mm. sort of investors will you be looking for? Because like, uh, for example, some startups mm. would uh, look for investors that can give them connections. So they'll look at the portfolio companies under the investor where it's like, mm. hey, these few startups are invested by the same investor and they can sort of connect with us to form an ecosystem, right? Uh, there are other founders that purely find venture capital based on their relationship with the venture capitalists. Like, I think that they agree with our direction and thus we should uh, go with them, right? And then some people just look for uh, VCs that can give them the most amount of uh, capital, right? So because they feel that, hey, I don't need anything else other than capital and capital is the, uh, like more capital means faster growth. So like, what mm. do you what do you think you would look for in an investor if let's say you're going for funding like next time or in the future? Uh, yeah, I think for me, I, I'll prefer if I can work with someone that understands what we're doing, like have the same direction. To be very frank, maybe because like I, I spoke to quite a number of people in the scene already, but I do know that across founders, if we want to do partnerships, even if it's a different VC, Singapore is right. really small, right? And you don't need to be funded to actually collaborate with them if it's a win-win for both of you. Right. right, And uh, in terms of getting money just for the sake of money, you might as well take a loan. right? right. <laughs> yeah, so it's really dependent on your point of view. But uh, I would say that I'll still look at, generally when we want to fundraise, I think we'll just prepare the deck and get people to introduce us to a few VCs. And when they get back to us, we'll discuss the potential synergy and the terms eventually. right? So it's not really like you can zoom in and say, okay, I'm going to work with this guy because this guy has this particular company that I can integrate with. Right. right? It, it might not really work out that way. So I, I don't think anyone really targets VCs in, in that area, like, like right. from that perspective. Yeah. Right. But what would be your ideal VC? Like maybe, maybe not names, but like qualities that you look for. Like, do you need, do you require mentorship? Do you require connection? Like if let's say you can choose something mm. that you would prioritize uh, in an investor, what would you prioritize? Okay, so we are we're prioritizing between mentorship, network, 
and uh, just money. Size. Yeah, sorry. yeah. Okay, funding size. Um, I'll say network then. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, mentorship is a very loose term, honestly, because even friends can be your peer mentors. So right. I'll say networks will be really, really crucial, especially if you're going into a new market. You right. probably need uh, VCs that have like access or other portfolio companies there that will be able to like smoothen the entire um, process of integrating a company over. What about mm. somebody who can who have done it before? So like I think just now you mentioned that in the US and in other bigger markets there are mm. apps like this. So mm. what if like uh, it's an investor who have done it before? Maybe they used to be a founder of such an app, right? Would that then trump the connections that a potential VC might have? So like if let's say you can choose now, the mentorship mm. that I'm talking about will be somebody that have done it before. They have grown uh grow an app similar to yours and expanded mm. it to several markets. Right. And the other VC has the connections to give you an ecosystem. So for example, maybe uh if if it's like a cloud uh you need like cloud computing, then uh, maybe one of their portfolio company does that. Something like that. Just an example. So mm. which one would you then choose? I mean ideally of course you want somebody with both, but which one would you then choose? Uh, I think um having an operator who have done, been there, done that before would be right. good. But it's really also down to the person's personality. You don't want right. someone to come in with like, a, you know, oh, okay, this is how I did it. This is how it's going to work. You can't do that. That's going to fail. Right. So I'm personally close friends with um one of the, the, my, my competitors in Australia, my Airtaskers co-founder. Yeah, Jonathan's actually based in Singapore. So I actually knew him for two years already. And he has been like looking at our app too. So right. I'll say that even though he has been there, done that, he has a perspective of the Australian scope. Right. right, he understands how it works right. in Australia, which uh, we did have a few conversations and we also agreed that it's not that similar over in Singapore. Although I'm sure Air Task will work here. La, so it's going to be a comp- competition for us if he brings it over. So it's really, really down to the individual himself if you're talking about the operator that's been there. Right. Yeah, I think that part, that part's really tricky. It's, because even though it's scoped that way, the, the main problem is the person that you'll be working with. So usually for founders, we always talk about selecting the right partner not just right. selecting the right firm. You want to choose the right person in there that will invest in you. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, so I think I would like to move a bit towards the current situation. Mm-hmm. So like, uh, because currently we have this whole work from home COVID situation that's going on. So how did COVID impact your business? I, uh, in my opinion, I feel that there might be a big impact because now people can't go out right? yeah. unless it's for essential services. So like, uh, what was the impact and what do you do to mitigate the impact? All right. So um, once we actually heard of, um, not heard of, once we've seen how bad the whole COVID situation was going and we haven't actually went on to circuit breaker yet, right? Uh, the rest of us got together and created a new category called online. So people can right. start posting online tasks so we can facilitate a new area of like programming, designing and stuff like that just to try out. Yeah, and uh, that one helped a little. But the more shocking part is, as you mentioned, when we thought everyone is stuck at home, um, the number of users, interactions, task posted, transactions were definitely dropped. That's what we all right, thought. And we right, were like yeah. really, really worried. We were like fighting every day, trying to see how we can make things easier. Um, the last thing we would realize was uh, actually a 230% growth. for right. our, Yeah, we usually grow month on month at 40%, mainly because we are small. So 40% is a pretty okay number for us. Um, but as, <laughs> during Circuit Breaker, the first week alone, we actually facilitated hundreds of tasks. And uh, we started having more than 100 users signing up per day when our usual is around 30, 40. Right. Yeah. So um, it's actually quite shocking because what we essentially uh, realized is that the essential workers are actually picking up tasks along the way, which is uh, what else I was created for. It's like a side quest thing. Right. Where you can do things when it's convenient for you. Uh, people are starting to pick up all these along the way jobs and uh, helping our users to do a lot of deliveries. The next thing we realized before home bakers were banned is that this home businesses needed people to send deliveries to. Right. And we were significantly cheaper compared to um, grab send, which um, just to give you an example, a task was completed for $8 on our site when the usual price would have been 30 on grab delivery. Yeah, so these home businesses realized this loop and I think they started sharing with their friends. So essentially, um, we actually took off because of the circuit breaker rather right. than actually suffering, which we thought would happen. Yeah, so we started to make product changes as we speak to these users and understand what kind of things they need and what are the things they look for. And yeah, essentially, we, we kind of like are growing quite steadily nowadays. Right, so um, I think I want to go a bit into the whole circuit breaker and your growth um, mm. in a sense. Like, you did mention that you were significantly cheaper uh, as compared mm. to other platforms um, like 
you you mentioned an example of the delivery fee, right? And it only costs eight dollars to send things through your app. But hmm. how do you ensure that the person will really send the the thing from like 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 as stated lah, which is like from hmm. maybe uh place A to place B, right? What if he just runs off with the product or something like that? Like how do you ensure the security and the like safety of uh the all your orders and all your deliveries and your quests? All right. So uh, first, first thing, like uh, I think the the, the term cheap, uh, I'll prefer like um to state it as is because it's based off um what our users deem as fair value for them, right? right. So it, I won't I won't say that it's because we offer cheap services. It's mainly right. I'll say that they receive a lot of offers that were higher priced, but um of course the higher will choose the cheaper, right? So right, right. Uh, I'll answer this from a marketplace point of view. If we are Carousel now and um Carousel starts um someone sells a fake ticket on Carousel. Right. You paid the money and they don't actually do it. The yeah. next thing that you get is actually the police contacting you. Yes, right? I'll <laughs> yeah. assume that. I'll so, assume, yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's kind of how, how we should view things. As a marketplace, we are only the middleman. We try our best to link up both parties and right. you select what you want. Meaning that this person sends you an offer, you look at the profile and you hire this person. After you hire this person, there's a communication that's enabled in outside, a third party call, which is must to protect your privacy and also a chat and um, status of the task that you can update and check in with each other. So we build stuff like that. But the main thing that would prevent these kind of issues from happening is, of course, um, we actually do checks. Uh, we, we do identity checks before they come into our site. Right. Which is actually fast and seamless. It's the basic kind that you go through either social media or through your email. And we verify via your phone number. Right. After your phone number, in order to do a task, you actually need your credit card. So we actually verify you on three levels already by the time right. that you get to post a task or do a task. Right. Mm. Okay, then um, I was just wondering, like, um, because of your business being very B2C, uh, mm. consumer-facing, right? How do you, have you ever gotten like a bad review of the app? And if let's say you did, uh, how do you do customer recovery? Uh, yeah, and stuff like that. Because a lot of... Um, founders or like startups like um if they are b2c market they live and die by reviews uh, especially mm. on the app store right so how do you mitigate bad reviews i i would say one one hack that we had like we, we definitely had our own share of bad reviews of like oh app keep crashing that kind of stuff right uh, in the earlier days that we launched the app when it's really maybe it's just them installing when their internet connection was not stable or they went into a leaf, which was actually what we found out when we contacted them. So um, there's a standard response on um, the Play Store and App Store is that we reply them as soon as we can and also tell them to reach us at a certain email and also try to reassure them that this does not happen to other users. You know, right. you want to tell them like X, X number of users did not have issues with facilitated XX. So you can give examples there. But the best hack we had so far was to actually include um, channels to reach us on Facebook and Instagram. And we realized that a lot of people are actually starting to message us through our Facebook page or Instagram account and start asking right. stuff like, oh, hey, my payment went through, but um, it's still spinning on the app or, or stuff like that. And they tell us directly. So rather than them needing to leave a review for us to know, they actually start speaking to us. So I'll say that creating a channel, um, social media, ideally, uh, for them to speak to you will, will be one way that uh, probably averted a lot of bad reviews for us. Right. Mm. Cool. So um, I think the, the second part of the question then of the COVID thing would not then be as relevant because um, uh, the second part of the question was more of like damage control, right? Like how do you do to pivot? But I think because you saw tremendous growth and opportunities. So like, how do you build on that? Like, how do you build on this unexpected traction that you have uh, right now? Hmm. Okay, actually, I, I want to address the, the previous question first. Like, um, we actually had to make some changes in order to reach this growth. And it's right. the fact that um, COVID came along and we realized, okay, we have an app that's really suitable to connect people nearby to help each other. And we shouldn't be thinking about profiting right now when everyone is having so much difficulties. So what we right. did is that we actually essentially uh, made our business, uh, we, we have a business platform that we are actually providing right now. Like we are giving this to businesses and we are giving it for free. So we make it easier and we help them to facilitate with an account manager for free when it's usually supposed to be charged because it's kind of like our business model. And we cut our commission fee by half for the usual like task completions. Right. So usually we take 20%, but uh, during uh, circuit breakout and due to this whole COVID situation, we cut it down to 10. And um, a- anyone that uh, runs a startup that has payments that's transacted, we already know that we are not profiting when we charge 10%. 
because right. um, Stripe and PayPal is essentially 3.4 to 3.9% plus 50 cents per transaction. Right. right. So anyone that knows, like, um, so they, they can really see that we are really not doing this for profit and we are really just trying to link as much people as we can, which also explains why we grow quite, it grew quite significantly across the circuit breaker. Right. Yeah. So that, that was be, our damage yeah. control. Yeah. Sorry. Mm. Then uh, would you then be very worried that because people are very used to this lowered commission rates and this free platform, that mm. when you start charging them uh, after COVID, where everything goes back to normal, that you'll start losing a tremendous amount of users because this will be users that maybe did not factor in the price needed or the additional price increase uh, because they, maybe they just started using this app during this period where there was mm. already a price reduction. Yeah. Mm. So how do you like mitigate this or uh, how I would see it as a potential user drop-off after mm. COVID? I think for us, um, it's pretty simple. Like, although we are everyday app, we don't tend to get like every user on board. We, we do want users who are more understanding and believe in what we're doing. So right. even if there's a drop-off, if the rates are different, we, we still believe that there's a significant amount of users that will stay. Because um, we do have competitors around like, and globally, marketplace rates has always been 20%. Right? Right. And, uh, yeah, but we're definitely going to try to test a few different ways to do the charges to make sense of our business model too. But ideally, yeah, I, I don't see much of an issue even if users do link due to the price difference, the commission rate being raised again, because I think that's only fair. We can't help them and, you know, not pay ourselves forever. Right. Yeah, it doesn't make sense as a platform either. So, yeah. So, um, I think I want to go a bit deeper into customer retention, right? Mm. Uh, how do you ensure, like, are there anything that you build into the app itself, like features that would, help um, generate some app loyalty because for example I, I wouldn't think it would cost that much for a competitor to just copy your app or copy the features on your app right mm. so yep. how do you prevent users from just being on multiple apps but actually try to incentivize them to just be on your app mm, the, the main thing is why, why would you want exclusivity on this right because like just for example if you run Facebook do you really want to stop people from being on LinkedIn Right. I mean, essentially, they have different focuses, right? Facebook, right. Instagram. I'll say that even for outside, whether you compare us to um, job portals or service marketplaces like um, Carousel, um, I don't see what's wrong with not keeping them in the app. So what we did is we actually don't want people to spend too much time browsing. We actually created a function for Task Alert and uh, it'll be live sometime later this month. Right. Um, so if you just type in your poster code and we alert you of tasks nearby that you can do. So you can set up the settings oh, and stuff. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we are, we're not big on it. In fact, we have a whole bunch of users who are like riders for, um, I think, Ninja Van. There's, there's probably a lot of Ninja Van people on our platform. Right. Yeah, and they are also the ones who are doing deliveries because they are already doing Ninja Van daily and they see things along the way that they can do. Right. So I, I won't really want to change that and make it like, hey, you must stay on our side. But we do have our own factors that will make us different which is, um, I, we never believed in being the cheapest, the fastest, or the best. But uh, we know one thing that's different for our founding team and others is the fact that we really love games. That's the whole reason that we could stick together for the last eight years, right? right. Um, so we decided, like, this whole questing thing, outside will have its own flavor of uh, gamification, whereby it really feels like a game that you can uh, gain level out of. And eventually, we might change the commission rate there. If you're higher level, commission rate might be lower. And at the same time, we might actually start doing some partner promotions, meaning that you might get points or at certain levels, you can start claiming discounts from our partner stores. Yeah, so those are the loyalty parts that we're aiming for, but it will come in later. Right, so you view gamification or like the the features of like having games and this entire experience being essentially a game as a unique mm. selling point that outside yes. have that there's an advantage compared to like other potential competitors that might pop up in the future. Yeah, I, I think the way we treat our users and the way that we view our brand um, is really not very commercial. We, right. we, we believe that we are really very community focused. I mean, five years is not a short amount of time for, for someone that's 25, right? That's like pretty much one fifth of my life that I spend working on outside with the rest. And yeah, we, we do think that although there are different ways to do things, we believe that we can make outside one of the way that people will enjoy more compared to others, even if it's higher price, even if it's not loading as fast, or even if there's not as much jobs. Yeah. Right. The experience, in short. 
Okay, cool. Mm. Um, I think uh, I have a few more questions with regards to um, after COVID, where it's more like, do you ever envision yourself to expand to other markets? Because uh, different markets have dem- different demographics, right? So uh, maybe uh, the Singapore market where you are in right now will be very receptive to games, but it might not be something that uh, would work in other countries or other markets or if even like because Singapore in general is very small so it's a lot easier to to just like take on quests and do it like maybe a delivery service right mm. so first part of the question is do you have any plans expanding overseas and second part of it is like how would you target the market and like which market will you select and why all right so part one for overseas it's a must there's no company that can exist with only the Singapore market Right. Uh, Singapore is really too small. Even if all of Singapore is using outside, we, we still need to grow somewhere, right? There's right. just success in one and then we have to replicate it over. So um, I also like to address the gamification parts. So gamification is like an add-on for the app, right? So right. Um, the core idea of it, just the tasking part, could easily be replicated across countries and we are pretty sure it will work. We actually right. spoke to people from uh, mirroring countries, countries that are similar to Singapore. Um, we spoke to investors from Korea, Japan, Hong Kong, Indonesia. Right. Yeah. So we do know that those are potential countries that uh, we can go into. And of course, like we won't be going island-wide the way that uh, we launch in Singapore. We'll launch um, city by city because outside is hyper-local. And that's also one of our USP, which is also one of our biggest flaws the fact that we only connect people who are nearby right. right yeah so that limits things a little but it's also how we plan to phase out our expansion start testing the product then slowly add in part by part for the gamification right yeah. but are mm-hmm. you concerned that uh, bigger players in the market might just replicate features that you might have would that be something that concern you, especially when you look for expansion? Because as you expand, your presence gets bigger. People start to take notice of mm. the startup and start to study your company, right? Would this be something that you will ever be concerned about, right? Because like, unless you have a IP with you where you can protect your app and stuff, mm. but if not, it will be quite. I, I would like, in my opinion, it will be quite easy for like mm. bigger players to replicate, right? Uh, to be fair, like I, I can replicate Grab in one week time with our team. We can replicate Carousel too. The thing that can be replaced is the network within the right. platform, right? So uh, I'll say that uh, for consumer apps like us, like if any big players were to actually replicate us, that's like probably the highest form of flattery we can get from them, right? right. Uh, and yeah, I think it will still be fine because essentially it's just a different way of doing things. And if they really just directly copy us, I, I would like to believe that everyone still have some basic respect for each other in here. We won't be replicating entirely. And I don't think there's an exact company that's doing, that there isn't a company that's doing exactly what we are doing. And it's not easy even for big players like Grab to just turn it over and just tell people like, hey, now you can start delivering stuff for others. Like it's right. a pretty different game from on demand, but it's still doable. right? Um, I think we'll, we'll still be fine. It'll still just be another wall. There's no way we can get 100% of the market share. right? Sure. So when the time comes, we'll definitely try to differentiate ourselves a bit more whether in terms of state, like the first mover advantage that we have or the other products that we are currently building to try and make the app different. Right. So let me add in another part, which I think will be a bit tough for them to do. So outside is the consumer facing app. It's supposed to be simple. Everyone's looking at it. They know how it works. They're not supposed to know like, oh, is there AI behind or uh, what other things are this company doing, right? So for us, we are integrating, uh, we have this system called Inside API, right? So outside is the app and inside is the API that we are actually using to scale the business. Right. Um, Inside API is, is actually integrated to our partners' platforms. So imagine, let's say, um, one day if Facebook accepts it, it, on Facebook, you can see jobs nearby or there's a oh. community tasking section oh, and you'll put up outside instead. So we already have nine partners on board and we're actually building to, to launch at the end of Q2, uh, student-based right. base, and elderly-based. So, so you're making like an ecosystem. Basically, you're building an ecosystem of partners. Correct. And we're just doing revenue sharing because the idea is that these people want to create something like that and we are creating a new business stream for them, right? a new business, model, right, a business right. model. Yeah, they can earn money. And at the same time, we can now connect people between two other platforms. Because right. like you mentioned, when you come to the outside, you only look at jobs, which means that you won't come in like three hours a day. But if you're scrolling through an elder social media, for example, like our partner's uh, footprints, um, if it's an elder social media and you're checking out what your friends are doing, at the same time, you can just tap on jobs and just see if there's anything nearby you can do. 
Yeah, right. so it adds more value to them. It adds more value to us. So outside as an app, it's a fun experience that we're selling. But essentially, the idea of connecting um, is our main goal. Like connecting platforms and ecosystems together will be what our site really stands for. Yeah, but consumers won't know that because they'll just be <laughs> using it somewhere. Yeah. Right. So, so it won't be easy your, to replicate. Your goal is to make it as convenient as possible for the consumer to access jobs, regardless of what apps that they are using, through like even your partner apps, right? right. Uh, your partners and stuff. Now, oh, as long as they get connected to someone reliable, right? right? So equally verified across all platforms. And yeah, we that's that's how we plan to scale up. Mm. All right, that's really cool. So I think um I'd like to wrap this up with like Two questions, actually. So the mm. first question uh, would be, how would you envision outside to grow? Like, what would be a direction that you'll be going for now? Mm. I want people to love what we are doing, the way that we love what we are doing. So for us, we have always been really, really passionate about the gamification part. But uh, as you would know, like um, VCs or consumers in general, they focus more on uh, how many users do you have, like, have you been making enough money? And sadly, like as much as we want to follow our passion, um, you know, we still got to make sense for the money. Right. So I, I do see ourselves gamifying properly, meaning that um, I do see, I want people to love what outside is really supposed to be. And right. I want people to have a fun experience. So what I see outside growing into is really a community app that people can use to set up like you know helping each other with like daily inconveniences in a very fun way I mean that I want people to start sharing like their achievements like if you help someone on um, Valentine's Day you're now Cupid assistant that's like a new endorsement title that you receive right so we want to make it really really fun that people will start sharing and people will enjoy helping each other even more and that's how we expect it to grow over in Singapore like hopefully within the next year mm. right so um, as a person who I would say have some experience running a startup, how mm. would you give advice to, let's say somebody totally new? Mm. Or like, what's the biggest learning that you got out of your experience so far that you feel is quite important for aspiring entrepreneurs to actually keep in mind when they start their startup? I think um, learning to learn will be part one if you ever want to be a founder. Right. Um, I'll say that I, I am actually able to help out with every department of the company, which I still do today. Like I, I lead the business side, but um, I still help with product and branding and designs and marketing. Yeah. So usually for us, we were more, I guess we, we learn things on the go and you really need to learn how to learn things fast and effectively. Um, learning to Google is always part one. Like if you know how to Google, you can do anything. <laughs> Just a matter of time after that, right? So the second thing of us, like, um, I don't think that solo founding is a good idea. It's always good to find someone as your backing, like um, real, real experience. I, it, has been, it has been a roller coaster for me. It's really not that easy to start up. Everyone just see the glory sides, right? And when you fall back, who's there for you? Your family might not trust that, hey, starting out is a good idea. They'll just tell you, hey, go out and work. Like with your degree, is like three, four K, right? right? Rather than going through this. Um, ultimately, having a group of people that really have the passion and the same direction as you is going to make a very big difference. It's going to keep you going, right? You but won't you burn out. such a person? Uh, for me, I was very lucky, right? I, I grew up with them. <laughs> like, they're my secondary school classmates. Right. I started out with. Um, but I think no matter what, it's, it's pretty much like dating. You really got to find someone that's in sync. You won't know, maybe your best friend is the right person maybe he's not maybe a new classmate they just met if you've seen most of the success stories um in singapore i'll say most of them were like on carousel is poly classmates and then the rest of them are uni friends like it's quite common to find people with similar interests and also like you know have have the same drive on what they want to do yeah right but would so you I, think, then, um, hmm. sorry yeah please go ahead oh no, no yeah so i was just saying that um most likely they might already be around you. Like, it's just whether everyone has that same drive. If not, there's right. always like founder matching programs. Yeah, got to try. But are you not worried that if let's say, because you all started off as friends mm. before you all start your, found, uh, your startup as a uh, founder, I think just now earlier in the podcast, you did mention about how you had to, there was a line that had to be drawn between professional and friendship. But are you mm. not worried that in the event that let's say you really have conflicting directions on where you want to bring outside. So maybe uh, in the future, it's like expansion to different markets and you all have very different direction on where you want to bring it, that it might affect the friendship mm -hmm. or your, the reverse might be true that because of your friendship with the person, you might then decide to give in and be like, hey, I think you're right. 
I'll, I'll say that I trust my guys enough that we are all choosing what's best for the company. If someone is really, really rejecting something, they, they will have a good reasoning. Right. right. So we will definitely listen to each other and like weigh things out on what makes sense. And also, I, I think it really boils down to communication. Right. right? Let's say it's, if it's a big decision, it's really about communication. And everything should be towards what's the best for the company and not what's the best for you. Like, example, if I love anime and I want to go to Japan, no matter what, we should expand to Japan, right? right. That, that, that'd be too selfish and it won't make sense. And if I say that, I know that the other three will definitely stop me too. Right. Right. So I think it's, it's really just a basic, like, you know, area that we, we all know that it has to be done for the sake of the company. And we always, like, there isn't a dictatorship, although there is a joke that they always call it a dictatorship because I'm the one that usually directs stuff. Yeah, I, I, I would believe there's mutual respect there and understanding on the direction for the company. And um, to address the part for professionalism when it comes to friendship, right? Yeah, um, although startups are meant to be flexible, uh, this is this is another advice, I guess. <laughs> although startups are meant to be flexible, especially when you're working with friends, it's better to set up the deliverables and also have a proper reporting system. Right. Like we do weekly check-ins, weekly reports. And right now, because of the circuit breaker, we are doing it daily instead. Right. So, yeah, we start the day together at 10 a.m. on a Zoom call, like all of our members. And we just talk about what we did and what we are going to do today. And we arrange meetings with each other if we need to. So those are really important. Communication is number one when it comes to running a company. Mm. Right. Thank you so much, Nicholas, um, for um, being willing to come onto the podcast and share your learnings and your advice. I Personally, I felt like uh, if I could sum up my learnings, it would mainly be that communication is extremely important. Uh, it's always good to find a good or reliable founding team that you can trust because uh, so that to avoid potential issues that might come up later on. And then when it comes to your app, I, actually, I feel like your app is a very interesting take on the whole, uh, I would say geek economy mm. system where you're just your marketplace and then you get people to connect with each other with like, unique requests. I mean, like, I'm sure the requests on your apps uh, will be like relatively unique and it's not like confined to just like, hey, delivery or like food delivery, that kind of thing. Like there are a lot of other tasks that you can do there. And uh, I'd like to end this off by saying that uh, good luck and all the best. Uh, Thank you so this, much. Yeah, uncertain time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Yihun. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Yihun, the host for this podcast. I'm trying out this new segment for this episode and future episodes where I share my biggest takeaway from the interview. In this episode, I feel that my biggest takeaway was when we were touching on the topic of having a friend as a co-founder. In my opinion, I feel that this might be a situation that some startups face as we might meet our co-founders through school or work or like even mutual friends. The problem might come, in my opinion, when there are disagreements during discussion. This is as it is difficult not to be emotionally invested in something that you put in so much effort into. And thus, I feel that having friends that are your fellow co founders might cause strain in your friendship in the long run. And I think what Nicholas said was very interesting, where he shared that they were set deliverables beforehand. Like, for example, I'm going to do these things today. And they will constantly update each other on their progress. In my opinion, I feel like this would allow for a separation between work and personal life, which thus might mitigate any potential strains on relationship because uh, whenever you discuss about work, it will be based on this list of things that you really set up to do. And I think when you're off work, you don't really mention this and thus it provides some form of barrier between work and personal life. Let me know what you think about the new segment. I'm very interested to hear about your comments and feedback. I hope that it was an insightful session for you. If you would like to hear more from us, do follow us on Spotify and Google Podcasts. Thank you and till next time, stay safe.